Okay, this morning we're redoing something that I did August 19th. What is today? The 26th, 26th so a week ago. I set up uh, Labiotrophus filibarni. Note that I pronounced that. Oh, so Maya, come over here. Maya, I'll pet you. She won't. Uh, come here, Osa. Uh, I pronounce that terminal I on full of Barney as a long E because that's a Latin ending and that's how Latin is pronounced. Uh, I know I'm the salmon trying to jump up Hoover Dam here, but uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to force the proper use of uh, Latin terminal letters. <laughs> okay. Susie's pointing out that Lake Mead is so low right now that even if I got over the dam, I'd probably die on the other side uh, if I were a, a salmon. And of course, salmon don't jump up uh, the Colorado River anyway. They're, uh, they're cold water fish. Okay, anyway, we, I set up two males and seven females, the only seven uh, full of Barney gold females that we had in this vat have two males, one that's lavender and one of them that I was toying with setting up separately anyway because uh, he's uh, got some really nice orange freckling. Uh, but I've noticed while I'm doing feedings that he's hanging out at the top, meaning the other male is feeding up on him. So I'm going to move them out of this 110 gallon vat they're in uh, to split them into two breeding colonies, uh, two small breeding colonies, but that's all the females we have. Right now, the winter storm was really, really rough on that, this particular fish. Now, if you look at, uh, Susie, come a little closer. If you look at it, the way this is set up, oh, so, come out of the way. Uh, this is a, what we call a fry cage, and in it, we've got a couple of cichlid hotels that we make. And there are a couple more that this fry cage is sitting on, so the fish can go underneath. And then we've got another cichlid hotel, that black pipe thing. Uh, that the adult females can hide in, and we have some horn work in there. So anyway, I'm going to break this down, take the fish over to, this is in greenhouse two, take the fish over to greenhouse one. I have two 55s that I'm setting up for, uh, for breeding. We'll go look at those, and I'll break this fat down, and we'll show you the fish again. I'll be back in just a bit. Okay, we're in greenhouse one. I'm going to show you the 255s we're going to set up for breeding. We're going to have male and three females in one, male and four females in the other. I'm going to try to select the goldest females to go with the, uh, or the oranges to go with the orange male. Susie, come up here and I'll show you how we set these up. These are the two vats I'm going to use. I'm going to turn the water on. have two valves on this in case one of them clogs, which does happen. Okay, this is a fry cage, place for fry to hide. This is a, a cichlid hotel for females uh, to hide in. Same thing in this one, cichlid cage and a, uh, a cichlid hotel, or a fry cage and a cichlid hotel. You might note, looking down this row and the next row, how many empty vats there are. Those are the ones that don't have water flowing. That's because we're still way down from our normal uh, population of fish. Uh, by this time next year, we should have all our vats full. Right now, about 20% of them are empty. Uh, and the other, a lot of the others are way down. For example, if you look at this, these are adult male uh, Psittacara morii. Uh, we have 14 of them in there, and normally we'd have around 60 or 70 of them. Okay, anyway, I'll be back in a few minutes after I catch the fish out of the 110 in Greenhouse 2 and sort them into two groups, and we'll show putting them up. Back in a minute. Well, as often happens when we're doing things, even though I have things planned out ahead of time, the fish change my mind or circumstances change my mind. When I pulled the eight breeders out of uh, the 110, there were a bunch of fry. Uh, so rather than leave that 110 just for fry, I don't want to move the fry, they're too small to move. Uh, at least one of the seven females was carrying uh, eggs uh, a week ago and 
or by that time probably carrying fry and release them. So I'm going to put the uh, lavender male and probably four females back into that 110. And I'm going to put the orange freckled male and the three females in the 55. Uh, let's take a look at the two males first and then we'll sort the females. Okay, colors don't always show up on video. I noticed that on our uh, uh, blue marmalade uh, the other day, full of Barney's that, that didn't. This is the lavender male. And this is the orange freckled male, which by the way, the orange freckled male was the one hiding. Even though the lavender male is smaller, he's apparently more aggressive. It's always risky to just have two males in a, in a bat. Uh, it's better to have more than, than that. I usually go with three, but not in a 110-gallon bat and the 300-gallon bats. Okay, well, right now we're going to sort these seven females. By the way, here's something annoying. This is a trumpet snail that's appeared in the system. How it got in here, I don't know, but it's in both greenhouses now. Uh, this one's not, we have the little Malaysian trumpet snail that stays real tiny and it's a pain because it gets in the, it says you want to hand me one of the strainers over there. Okay. This is a strainer we put on the bats to stop little fish from going through and you see uh, those dead snails, those are little trumpet, Malaysian trumpet snails and uh, when the things clog up I just stick my finger in and rub it around and those end up slicing your finger open you can drop that back this one's a bigger trumpet snail it gets about an inch long uh, but i have no idea where it came from okay i'm going to look at these females and pick i think i'm going to put that female with the orange freckled one and that with a lavender male that's going to go with a lavender male what were you saying I would have, might have gone the opposite, but... You would have? Well, but see, I know the fish, you don't. I know. Okay, that's three females I'm putting this in. That one's going to go with the orange male. I would have agreed with that one. That one's carrying and is going to go with the orange male. Oops. There's one missing? Yeah, missing a fish. Oh, well. She may still be in the 110. I was going to put four males back in there, uh, four females back in there anyway, so I'm not going to bother with it. Okay. No, that's right. We had six females and two males, uh, so I got everybody. Uh, okay, so we have these three. Let's take a look at these. Uh, a female here. This one, I think, see, she's kind of orangish. I'm going to put her in with the orange male. Oops. By the way, she's carrying. You notice she didn't spit her eggs? Uh, and that's because after generations in our system, fish that spit their eggs don't leave as many offspring because they miss a, a breeding cycle. And so we, uh, uh, our system selects for females that are really good about carrying. Okay, this is a young female that I'm going to put in with a lavender male. So that lavender male and this female are going to go back into the 110. Because I pretty much suspect that the offspring in, in that bat belong to the lavender male since he's the dominant one. And then this orange male is going to go in with three females in a 55. And I showed you all those later, or earlier rather. So that's male and has three female oranges, and this is lavender. The gold full of um, the I like the lavender males. You can select for gold males, but I think that's a, a pleasant con uh, contrast having a lavender male and a gold female. And the three females I picked, despite Susie disagreeing with me on one of them, are females that are going to throw good lavender males. If you look carefully at their coloration, they've got a little bit of lavender in them. Uh, 
they'll throw good, nice gold females, but uh, lavender males. I'm hoping on these oranges that we can intensify that. What we'll do here, I envision a fish a lot more orange than that male. Uh, so what we will do, we'll produce a, a batch of uh, fry from from him, grow them up, take the the oranges females out of that, mate them back to him. Uh, we'll grow up that batch of fry, and if we have a, a male that's more orange than his father, and by this time grandfather, uh, we'll substitute him and give him his sisters. Uh, the orange sisters, and we'll continue to, if we don't get somebody oranger, we'll make him back to his granddaughters. Uh, and we'll continue this process of picking the, the best male and mating him either to his offspring or to his siblings uh, to concentrate the genes for orange. Uh, that's fairly heavy in duty inbreeding, but we inbreed all the time. It's the best tool you have. Uh, our prize-winning mollies uh, are all highly inbred. Uh, the trick in inbreeding is to, is rigorous selection. Uh, and what you're doing with inbreeding is concentrating good genes, but you're also exposing de deleterious uh, recessives and getting rid of them in a population. Uh, did that with our uh, Xenotaca isonies. We got it, we started with a half dozen fish, that's a live bearer from Central Plateau of Mexico. We started with a half dozen fish, and the first generation we had about 10% of them with crooked spines. Uh, we purged all those, didn't allow them to breed, bred from the best, healthiest uh, fish. The next generation, the number of crooked spines dropped off. Finally, after about five or six generations, we don't get any more crooked spines. Uh, and that's because we kept removing those genes from the population. One of these days, I'll get a marker board and markers that actually work in the greenhouse, and I'll show you uh, a Hardy-Weinberg equation, which explains why this happens, why you, you can get rid of deleterious genes through inbreeding. Uh, okay, so I'm going to set these two up. We will... Uh, on both of these lines, we'll continue to use these two males until one of their sons is better. Then we'll use the, use the son, uh, and we'll select for really nice lavender males in this line and gold females in this line. We'll select for both orange males and females. Good fish keeping.